Okay, guys, so this is the Year of Good Feelings, Day 2. We talked about the literature and the art and all the wonderful things that were happening as far as nationalism. And Monroe is president. He is the last of the founding fathers, uh, the death of the Federalist Party, and he is going to continue the Virginia dynasty, with the exception of John Adams and uh, all of the presidents up to this time. Washington, Adams from Massachusetts, <laughs> Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, all from Virginia. This is James Monroe, and James Monroe uh, had been state. You can see he is ranked as number 13 in 2017, and yeah, he's, he's moved up one one spot from 14 to 13. They call it the era of good feelings. They do that because it's all Democrat Republican. It is misleading. There is um, more dissension between the South, the West, and the East Coast or the North. Uh, the tariffs going to go up, and there's um, argu arguments about that. There's arguments about building roads and canals. Do we keep us? Do we? have a second bank of the United States. Um, we're going to have a, a, actually a depression as a result of the sale of public lands in the West. And because of the slavery issue, Mr. Clay, who we're going to talk about, the great compromiser, is going to come up with the first of his compromises, the Missouri Compromise. So factions within the party. So they call it the era of good feelings, but there were a lot of things so these are the two major issues when we talk about Monroe's presidency. The Panic of 1819, our first really Great Depression, and the Missouri Congress. And the Panic of 1819, it was, it was a good one, y'all. Uh, the causes, um, we were buying up, we, people were buying up a lot of land as they expanded to the West. And they had made loans to these folks. Well, because of inflation from the war and then um, economic downturn, they could not repay these loans. And once again, as you remember from Shays Rebellion um, and from, uh, uh, you know, just rebellion of farmers during this period of time, that when you're trying to take somebody's land, you're going to have some very unhappy folks uh, a budget deficit is going to drain it of specie. Specie is coin or gold. And um, these these wildcat Western banks, as, as well as the Bank of the United States, is trying to foreclose on this land, which is, is making people very... So they are calling for reform. And the Western farmers say, you know, you, you've got to give us a break here. And this is going to stimulate a desire. You remember we... They, didn't want any federal government interfering with them, but now that's going to change. Wait a minute. We, we need to have some help here. So they're going to pass something called the Land Act of 1820, and that is going to give assistance to these, these uh, settlers, and it calls for an end to debtor's prison. You know, at this point in time, we had thousands of people that we'd thrown in jail for being in debt, and... He said, how can you pay your debts if you're in prison? So we're going we're gonna to end that. The Missouri Compromise. So remember, we're adding new states. We saw that before. And Missouri wants to come in as a state. And Missouri asked Congress to enter the Union. And the Talmadge Amendment, basically, you know, no more slave states. However, uh, that's going to destroy the sectional balance. And this... Jefferson, in one of his letters, said the slavery issue was like a fire bell in the night. And we have in this population boom in the north, but the Senate is still balanced. So entering new states, you got, they, they're figuring they've got to keep that Senate balanced. This is in peril, and uh, the, the Talmadge Amendment is going to be killed. So what are you to do? So. Henry Clay. And Henry Clay says, okay, we've got to fix this. This is what I propose. He said, let's let Missouri enter as a slave state. 
But we've got Maine up here that also can be a state, and that'll be a free state, and that'll keep the balance even. But from now on, we're going to make a dividing line, and you cannot have any slavery above the line of 36 degrees 30. And so the reaction to both sides, it's like, okay, but this is going to be temporary, but at least it is forestalling uh, an open. Hello, my learning friends. We got an oldie but goodie on the learning stove today, and we're going to cook you up some Missouri Hello, compromise friends, because it's going to be on, on the exam, and you have to know it. That's why. Because learning is fun. So, what are we waiting for? Why don't we go giddy up for that learning right now and go get her done? So, what are we waiting for? Why don't we go giddy up for that? Context is key in understanding that period before 1820, the Missouri Compromise, Context is going to be really key, key in understanding um, why it comes to be. So previous to 1820, really we have the era of good feelings, the decade before, so primarily identified because it is really one party in the United before. States. This primarily is the Democratic Republicans, better known as the really Jeffersonian Republicans. And after the fall of the Federalist Party in 1812 at the Hartford Convention, we see really a unification of southern Jeffersonians, Jeffersonians and northern Jeffersonians really into this one party, which did adopt some Federalist parties. You had the 1816 Tariff Act and the second authorization of the National Bank. So they're beefing up the central government, but they're not touching slavery at this point, and they're still expanding and allowing slavery to expand. You had Louisiana from the Louisiana Purchase joined the Union in this period, and it did come in as a slave state. But there's other problems, and one of those other problems is really kind of uh, the split in the House and in the Senate between Southern and Northern interests. It was pretty evenly divided, although slave states had been on a decline. And what we're going to see is the bringing up of the issue of the Three-Fifths Compromise. Many Northerners feel that this gives the Virginia dynasty or the Southern slave states more power than they're really deserving of because they're using slaves to gain representation. And the Senate is pretty much split as well. So when new states come in, everybody's kind of of watching Senate that to see if this is going to upset the balance in the House and in the Senate. You also see the coming into fruition of places from the Louisiana Purchase, which are pressing this issue. Enough people have now moved to Missouri. You had the cotton gin, which made it more profitable to uh, grow cotton in places like Missouri. And you also had hemp, which was a big crop in Missouri, which they wanted to bring slave labor to. But it really is more of an underlying question about whether we're going to follow the Constitution which is more of a pragmatic document that avoided the issue of slavery and left it up to the states, or are we going to follow more of the spirit of the Declaration of Independence, which the Jeffersonian Republicans in the North are pointing to, which is much more uh, egalitarian, which is talking about, you know, all men are created equal, and that's where we should be heading to, so we certainly shouldn't be allowing slavery to expand. But it's going to come to a head in 1819 in the 15th U.S. Congress by a man by the name of James Talmadge, Representative Talmadge from the great state of New York. And what he's going to do is he's going to stir the chicken coop with an amendment to Missouri coming in as a new state. And that amendment is basically going to require them not to have slavery. And that's what's going to cause all of the ruckus. It actually passed the House, but it's not going to pass the Senate. Actually, some northerner senators joined against the Talmadge Amendment, which is going to kill it. But it is going to bring to the floor you know, this issue of slavery and really ripping open some of the wounds that had kind of been uh, secretly hushed away in the corner for many, many years. And proponents of the Talmadge Amendment were pointing to the Declaration. They were bringing up the moral and ethics of slavery, and it really angered Southern legislatures like Representative Howell Cobb of Georgia, who told Talmadge on the House floor that he had kindled a fire which only the seas of blood could extinguish. And he might be right. But not for another 40 years. So, maybe you've skipped to this part. What is the Missouri Compromise? It's a compromise which is going to allow Missouri to come into the Union as a slave state. Now, that's going to upset the balance in the Senate and the House, you say. Fear not, my friends, because we're also going to bring in at the same time Maine, and that's going to kind of keep the balance. But the ingenious solution is going to be as ingenious a word? I don't know, but it's not a very smart solution. They're going to draw a line across the map which is going to exclude slavery from 
from any point north of parallel 3630 north, which is basically an east-west line along the southern border of Missouri. So this is actually good news for the northern states because you have states like Iowa and the Dakotas and Minnesota. You have a lot of land up there that's going to come in free. Um, Slave states are going to include Arkansas and Oklahoma below that line. But what that line did not deal with was all of that territory that belonged to Spain at that point that's going to come into the Union later as a result of the Mexican War. So it's really just a temporary solution. But that's the compromise that I guess saved the Union at least for about 40 years. Missouri slave state, Maine free state, magic line to solve all of our problems. So the effects, the last paragraph, maybe the most important one. Number one, it's going to postpone the Civil War for at least another 40 years. And in fact, we're not going to deal with this issue of slavery for another 30 years in the Compromise of 1850. We're going to take a whack at it with the Kansas-Nebraska Act and Popular Sovereignty. But make no bones about it, the Missouri Compromise is going to at least push this issue of uh, slavery in the expanded states and territories um, for a few decades. We also are going to have the end of the era of good feelings. No more good feelings. Those political parties are going to be divided now along that line, and we really are going to get more of a northern party when these uh, Jeffersonian Republicans and ex-Federalists wrap themselves up into the Whig Party and then later the Republican Party. And of course, Andrew Jackson is going to reband the Jeffersonian Republicans as the Democratic Party in the South. But this era of good feelings is over, and now there's going to be conflict that's being uh, really founded by the issue of slavery. And we also have an incredible precedent to point out, the precedent that Congress is the one that is now dealing with regulating slavery in the new territories. Now, previously, that had happened before. That happened under the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, where they banned slavery in these new Northwestern territories, and it seemed like the South was okay with it then. But that was the Articles of Confederation. This is the Constitution. And this precedent now may be as good for Northerners as they see a lot of Northern states being saved off from slavery, but certainly the South is getting some states as well. But more importantly, now whenever there's a problem over this issue, rather than turning to internal state legislatures to deal with the problem, we're looking to Congress to solve the problem. And eventually when they can't do that, that's going to mean civil war. And there were a few gentlemen back then, and maybe some ladies, who recognized this problem. And one of them was an elderly Tom. Thomas Jefferson, and we can hear what he thought about the Missouri Compromise right here. But this momentous question, like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it at once as the knell of the Union. It is hushed indeed for the moment, but this is a reprieve only, not a final sentence. A geographical line coinciding with a marked principle, moral and political, once conceived and held up to the angry passions of men, will never be obliterated and every new irritation will mark it deeper and deeper. TJ knew what time of day it was. There you go, my friends. That's the Missouri Compromise. I took it, I kind of crunched it up into a ball of learning, and I threw it through the YouTubes, and I hope that you caught it. And if you want to catch some more balls of learning, check out www.hiphues.com. Go to the video arsenal. We have over four or 500 videos. I've lost count at this point. So other than that, I'm going to ask you one more time. Have you subscribed? If you haven't subscribed, you probably want to do that right now or you're going to break my teacher heart. All right, my friends, I'm going to say it because I say it at the end of every lecture and I mean it with all of my heart. Where attention goes, energy flows. And we'll see you folks next time you press me buttons. Missouri Compromise looks like. You can see Missouri's up above that uh, 3630 line, but this is supposed to be um, the dividing line between North and South where slave states can. So this is going to last about 34 years until the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and this is going to remain a, a major issue in United States politics. The South is going to kind of separate itself from the North. It becomes, uh, uh, well, we'll talk about that with its own identity. And Clay, although he is a great compromiser, they said he might be better called an appeaser. 
So during all this time, John Marshall is the uh, Supreme Court Justice. And remember, we talked about Marbury versus Madison establishing judicial review. And he has this Federalist Hamiltonian. So some of the, the great cases that the court's going to hear, uh, Fletcher versus Peck. This is basically a land property issue. And um, a contract is made. There is uh, some... <laughs> I, what's a what's a bad bad uh, uh, business? There's actually some people that are crooks uh, as part of this Yazoo land controversy. But when people come back and they want their money back, the court is going to say it is a contract, is a contract, is a contract. And so even though the state said, well, these guys were crooks and they were not doing business the way they should have. They signed a contract, and this is the court saying, you know, you might you might have ruled this way, but you a contract is a contract, and we're overruling you. So this is an example of the court asserting its right to invalidate state laws. And you can look at the particulars of Fletcher versus Peck, but that's, that's uh, a big step where you overrule a state Supreme Court. Versus Hunter Lease. Uh, Virginia, this is this is loyalist property. Remember, part of the Treaty of Paris said that um, loyalists are um, must be compensated for their property, and they were basically, hey, they were on the wrong side, and um, you we're not going to compensate you. They're going to come back with Supreme Court and saying, listen, supremacy clause. This is we made this deal. We said that we would, and um, you as a state can't make that that um, decision. It was a federal decision. This is the supremacy law. So this is the who's the daddy of versus Maryland is another example of the supremacy clause. Um, Maryland tried to tax the Bank of the United States and Marshall said, sorry, a state cannot tax a federal entity. Okay, you can't do it. The power to tax involves the power to destroy. And so once again, it's kind of, again, who's your daddy? The federal government is superior to the state government. Hey guys, Mr. Hughes here. Um, I wanted to take a few minutes to kind of review some of your first court cases for the year without getting too fancy and uh, doing green screen and jumping around like an idiot. Just to be really straightforward with you so you guys understand um, what you have to know um, in order to be successful in this course. Um, one of the first things that I taught you, and I hope that you remember, is that we use jokingly the middle name Schwarzenegger for our early Federalists. So when we say George Washington, when we say Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, and now John Marshall, um, the, the Supreme Court Justice, we're going to use that Schwarzenegger name to remind ourselves in a very thematic way that they are changing the nature of federalism, that they are strengthening the role of the federal government and how it plays in that relationship with the states. So your first three court decisions that you must know or you must die trying to know would be Marbury versus Madison, McCulloch versus Maryland, and Gibbons versus Ogden. And I would say if you want more court cases or more in-depth study, you know, go to the Supreme Court for Dummies lecture and then from there you can, you can go deeper and go to other resources. But nevertheless, we'll keep it to, to really simple to the basics. Number one, Marbury versus Madison established judicial review. Say that like a thousand times. And if you say that a thousand times, you will get it right a thousand times. Because the concept is that judicial review is part of the unwritten constitution. This most powerful, flexible mechanism that we use in our government to change these major things like abortion and death penalty and affirmative action and um, suspects' rights all spring out of Marbury versus Madison. In the original text of the Constitution, there is very little guidance to as exactly what the Supreme Court and the federal courts will do, other than you know stating their lifetime terms, um, that they're appointed by the president, that the Senate is ratifying them, or you know voting on them. Um, there's not much else until Marbury versus Madison. 
Now, you can go in depth and go into the Midnight Judges and kind of the specificity of that case revolving around the election of 1800 or the revolution of 1800, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, um, Marbury being the judge, Madison being the Secretary of State. But if you just know Marbury versus Madison established judicial review, you should be good to go. Um, other court cases, uh, McCulloch versus Maryland. And the way that I explain this in class is that this is like a kid trying to tax their parent. So remember that the National Bank springs out of Hamilton's idea that Congress passes it with the aid of the Elastic Clause. Um, and then when it sets up shop in Maryland, in the southern states specifically, they don't want it in town. They're like, get the hell out of my state. So in order to get them out of the state, they start taxing them. Maryland is taxing the federal government. And again, this is like a kid. And if you're a kid, I, I, I ask you, go home and tell your mom you're taxing her and you're only charging her $100 to allow you to live in her house. And uh, she'll probably laugh really loud at you. And that's what John Marshall does. He's like, ha, 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 you're kidding. Number one, supremacy clause, baby. Who's your daddy? The federal government in this relationship, although it's not like a daddy, it doesn't run everything. Um, when it comes to fundamental ideas like national bank, Congress, congressional power, um, you can't tax the federal government. So that would fall under supremacy clause. And number two, he goes, necessary and proper, baby. That he's going to basically uphold the constitutionality of the national bank on the idea that Congress interprets the elastic clause. They decide like what's necessary and proper to execute their power. And in this case, they believe it's the National Bank. So the National Bank is good, who's your daddy? And we move on to Gibbons versus Ogden. In Gibbons versus Ogden, we have this, the same kind of idea of reshaping federalism, that the federal government is gonna get more power than the states when it comes to licensing rivers. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to go into the court case. I mean, there's boats and there's licenses and who runs the road, who, I mean, sorry, who runs the river. And at the end of the day, the court is going to decide that the Interstate Commerce Clause gives the federal government a leg up in issuing licensing, but more importantly, basically reformatting that Supremacy Clause or what I like to call the Who's Your Daddy Clause. So all three of these decisions are steroids for the federal government. They're going to um, enhance its power enhance its ability to do its job, to collect uh, revenue to currency, um, licensing, and more importantly, that unwritten power of judicial review is going to come back throughout the American history course to reshape public policy in many um, important ways. So get that down, guys, all right? One more time, Schwarzeneggerism, Marbury versus Madison established, McCulloch versus Maryland is about the National Bank and the Supremacy Clause and the Elastic Clause, and Gibbons versus Ogden, Interstate Commerce, and Who's Your Daddy? I'm not your daddy. I don't even want to be your daddy. Here's another uh, case that he's referenced. This is Dartmouth College, College versus Woodward. Uh, Dartmouth College wants to change it into a public um, university, but the charter had been granted in 1969, making it a uh, private uh, entity. Dartmouth is defended by our one of our great triumvirates, Daniel Webster. And once again, they come back and say, listen, this a charter is a contract, and you cannot void a contract just because you want to. So this is safeguarding business uh, from domination by the states. And but the negatives on that is how do you get out of that contract legally? few others, uh, Cohen's versus Virginia. This again overturns a Virginia Supreme Court decision, Gibbons versus Ogden. This establishes interstate and intrastate law. Okay, this is one where uh, uh, a contract was made to a uh, boat company to trade in New York, but he was going across the river to New Jersey and uh, they were going to give another contract and they said, nope, you can't, you know, interstate, this is, the, you can't, you can't have a monopoly. So if it's interstate, you're going from one state to another, that's a federal deal. That is not up to the individual state. So this is Daniel Webster, again, one of the great triumvirates, a great orator, a great writer. And it said that he actually helped Marshall with writing some of his 
some of the foreign policy that's going on after the War of 1812. We have the Rush Bagot Treaty, and that's basically we're not going to be fighting with the Canadians over a border line. We're kind of going to establish a, a, a permanent border. The Convention of 1818 with England. Now, John Quincy Adams is going to be a great Secretary of State. And that is that 49th parallel, and that is going to be the border uh, even through the, uh, from the lakes to the Rocky Mountains. Uh, we do a 10-year joint occupation of Oregon country, which we're going to um, actually negotiate with, with uh, Britain under Polk. And then uh, they made an agreement about fishing areas. So these are uh, just kind of showing what the United States looks like as of 1818. And you can see, you know, we still have a lot of territory that uh, with our, with our uh, manifest destiny that we have still to. Now tell me, so what is happening States in Florida? The Seminoles attack in Georgia and then hide in Spanish Florida. They get guns from the English traders. The Spanish governor protects everybody, including runaway slaves. The people of South Carolina and Georgia won't put up with this much longer. General Jackson will replace General Gaines now. Inform him, Mr. Calhoun, and make it clear that he is to seek out the Seminoles wherever he finds them, but under no circumstances is he to attack the Spanish force. How am I supposed to fight a campaign and win it? Still respect the Spanish rights of property. I have to go where the Seminole goes or I can't beat him. All right, John. Scratch that all out now and put this down. I respectfully submit a simple plan for solving the whole of the Seminole Indian problem. I take Florida away from Spain. You cannot do this thing. You cannot march in here into Spanish territory and occupy it. You have brought on war. General Jackson has gone too far. He's ignored the president's orders. We'll have a war on our hands. As secretary of war, I condemn his action. And are you of the same opinion, Mr. Crawford? As Secretary of the Treasury, it is my duty to advise, as Mr. Calhoun has suggested, that Jackson be punished and the Floridas be returned to Spain. Secretary of State, I disagree. The last thing Spain wants is a war with the United States. I'm for a complete investigation before a military tribunal. You would court-martial General Jackson and admit to Spain that we were in the wrong? He violated the direct instructions of the President. Did he, Mr. Clay? I think that's still to be decided. What about the Englishmen he executed? Spies. They gave guns to the Indians. The British have assured me they will make no protest. And may I add, Mr. President, if we punish the general in any public way, it will give Spain a decided advantage in our bargaining for Florida. Gentlemen, please. <clears throat> we will offer a price, but not too high either, to buy Florida from Spain. And if they accept, which I think they will, General Jackson will be named the territorial governor. John Quincy. And now we are going to have Florida. So we have the whole of the East Coast. John Quincy Adams also is the author of the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, we have these European countries fighting over different uh, countries in Latin America and South America. And as one would get its freedom, another European nation would swoop in. So this basically is telling Europe enough. You know, if you're already here, you can stay, but no more colonization in our hemisphere. Uh, Great Britain actually is kind of forced to, to uh, have an alliance with us on this just to protect its interest in Latin America. And we are, we're just warning them, stay. It's written by John Quincy Adams, and it's going to stay in effect. Theodore Roosevelt is gonna add a corollary, making us the policeman of our hemisphere. But uh, we're like, yeah, okay, America. Foreign reaction was, you know, who do these guys think they are? But with Britain as our kind of ally, and they still have control of the sea, uh, it's it's they're gonna they're gonna respect this. So there is a long term significance to this, and this is gonna be part of our foreign policy 
uh, until into the night. So John Quincy Adams, architect of the Monroe Doctrine, Secretary of State under will run for president. And this is a political cartoon showing us drawing the line. You cannot come across this line. He was one of the most significant secretaries of state in the United States, uh, um, negotiator to get Florida, and writer of the Monroe Doctrine. And we'll be talking about him in the next unit, The Rise of